All right. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning. For uh, those of you that don't know me, I'm on here. I don't know if I'm on back out there. Okay, great. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Chad, and just so good to be with you this morning, excited um, for what's in store for us today. Just, just a couple of things before we, we get going. Um, one is, is that you haven't come to church. Church is not a building. It's not something you come to once a week. Church is the continuation of the Jesus story with Jesus people. All right? And so if you're here this morning and you're, you're not a follower of Jesus, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. I used to not be a follower of Jesus. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that. I just want to give some context of, of what is actually important for us. So, so as Jesus people, we believe that there's no way that you can live an isolated life where you're an island unto yourself, that that only sets you up and the people around you up for failure, meaning that you'll, you'll function in an unhealthy way if you live an isolated um, life. So for us, it's very important to have particular rhythms, predictable patterns in our life where we're crossing paths with each other. And one of those rhythms is Sunday morning. So think of it this way. Think of like when you go, some of you, I don't, do, do people even do family reunions now still? I guess some people do those maybe, maybe not many. But used to, my dad was a kid, he would go to these family reunions and, unions, and it would be all kinds of different people who share a common DNA, a bloodline that would come and celebrate what it means to be this family. Well, for us, Sunday is that place where we who have a common DNA, meaning that we believe we belong to the family of God, not because we've done anything to earn it or deserve it, but because God has chosen us through Jesus. And now, as his people, we're called to be his kingdom representatives in the world until he makes all things new. And we believe it's important to come together once a week from all our different walks of life and extended families to cross paths with each other. And that's what we're doing this morning. That's what we're doing this morning. And so when we get together, we do things like we sing. And the reason that we sing is not because we're all good at singing or that it comes natural to us to sing. We sing because when we sing, we're reminded of who God is and what he's done. And when we sing, it taps into something in our minds that we just can't get if we just read a book, right? It's an experience that takes place. And so we're, it's important as we be reminded of who we are. Whenever we come on Sunday, we spend some time where someone who's up here like myself right now or someone else is able to say, this is what I think like the Lord may be saying to us as a family. And sometimes it's like spot on. Other times it's like, well, that one just needs to marinate in the carpet. We need to forget about that. And that's fine, right? We're coming together to travel together so that, so that when we leave from here today, we're better equipped to step into the things that God has for us this week. All right? So just in case you're wondering, that's what we're doing. All right? That's what we're doing here this morning. Um, we've been journeying the last several weeks looking at how do you move through different thresholds of your life? How do you get into new glass ceilings, breaking through a glass ceiling? Because unless you're moving or growing, you're dying. All right? The way you know someone or something is alive is it's moving or it's growing. Otherwise, it's dying. And so we've been asking the question the last several weeks, what's it look like to move through these glass ceilings, these new thresholds within our faith? Next week, we're going to begin a new journey. 
And what we see as we look at Jesus' life, so for us as a follower of Jesus, this book, the Bible, is very helpful in us understanding what God's way of life looks like so that we might apply it to our lives. And as we look at Jesus' way of life, we see a, a number of different capitals, investments, assets that he recognizes and operates with. And there's a particular order of those things. So for him, it's spiritual capital, relational capital, physical capital, intellectual capital, and financial capital. That those are all the capitals that we operate with, that we have. And it's important for us to know two things. One, what's the priority of those capitals? And then how do we invest them? How do I invest spiritual capital? How do I invest relational capital? Now, often in our culture, we have them backwards, where the prioritization is financial capital as number one, then intellectual, then physical, then relational, and then spiritual, meaning that we'll leverage things like spiritual capital to get more financial capital. So we'll say things like this. I think that I need to work more this week so that I can earn more money and I just won't go to missional community. Or I'm going to stay up late and do this to get some more money, but I just won't wake up and spend some time with the Lord. See, we'll, we'll we'll leverage spiritual capital. We'll get rid of it so we can try to gain more financial capital. And when we look at Jesus' life, it actually works the other way. And they're all important, but we need to have them in the right prioritization, and we need to know how to invest them wisely. Because we believe, I believe, let me say that, I believe that God expects a return on his investment. He's given me a measure of spiritual, relational, physical, intellectual, and financial capital, and he expects a return on his investment on all of those. He expects all of those to increase in my life. And so we're going to spend the next several weeks kind of diving into that. Today, we're going to finish up this journey of what it looks like to move through a glass ceiling. And what we've done is, and I think you had a card again on your seat today, is what we've done at Crossroads is we put together what we see as the journey of discipleship. And discipleship is nothing, that's the church word, that's the Jesus word for living the life that Jesus would live if he was you. That's what it means to be a disciple. To live the life that Jesus would live if he was you and give access to someone else of that life so they might live the life that Jesus would live if he was them. And we've identified a couple of different steps in that journey um, that's been helpful for us to describe what are those glass ceilings, those thresholds that we need to look at, all right? The first one, or the top one is the goal, the vision that Jesus has for his disciples, that he has for me, that he has for you, is that we would be spiritual parents, meaning we would give access to our lives, to help someone else live the life that Jesus would live if he was them. So I have four kids, right? I'm like, you know, I'm not just a spiritual parent, but just a parent. I have four children, and my job as a parent is to do what? To give them access to my life. I have it 24 hours a day. Well, not all, not I get, I get to work and stuff, so maybe less than that, right? But they live with me. One of them we've just deployed out to go do his thing in college, but they, why? They have access to our life, hoping what? That they get everything out of life that God wants for them. It's the same, same thought as a spiritual parent. But it's hard to be a parent if you haven't been a child, a son, or a daughter. And it's hard to be a child if you're not part of a family. And we just see that the way a lot of us become part of God's family is we're first a friend. And what often leads into friendship is when we've been a guest. And so guest, friend, family, son or daughter, spiritual parent, this is the discipleship journey that how we've articulated it that we see within 
the life of Jesus and the life of the early church. And the reason why we're saying this is important is this journey affects every other area of our life. So the way in which I'm attending to how I'm growing and becoming a follower of Jesus will affect every other area of my life in a positive way, in a positive way. And so we've just asked the questions. We looked at the story of the early church. So in your Bibles, you have the story of Jesus told in four different ways by four different folks, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you have what's called the book of Acts. And Acts is the story of where Jesus has deployed his spiritual children, his disciples, and told them to go do greater things. And we see that the 12 becomes 120, the 120 becomes 3,120, that 3,120 turns into 15,000, which then turns into half of the Roman Empire. So they seem to be doing a pretty good job of multiplying themselves out, which is interesting to think about how the church today in our culture seems to be going the other way, right? And it's interesting that the church in our culture kind of does things the opposite of the way they, they did it, and yet we think we should get a, the same result. It doesn't work that way, does it? So we just ask the question, how they do it? And we've seen there's a number of different ways that they move through a new threshold in their journey. First, they had to wait to receive something from, from Jesus. They had to wait, they received it, they shared it, then they implemented it, and then last week we saw they had to review. And today, this last step, this last piece to it, is then they reproduce what they've received. So every time I move into a new threshold, break through a new glass ceiling in my journey with Jesus, it's always so I can reproduce that into someone else, where I can give them all that I have. Every glass ceiling that I break through, I'm only breaking through because someone who's already broken through that glass ceiling has been willing to give me, to reproduce in me, what they've already received. All right? So we're going to go to Acts chapter 6 this morning. That's going to be a big number 6 you're looking for. And we're going to read um, I think like the first seven verses this morning. So this early church, this early family... They're growing. I mean, they are growing. They're multiplying. And some people have noticed that there are some people in the family that aren't getting fed. They're not being able to eat. There's not enough food. And it turns out that it's Hellenistic widows. Now, these would be widows, that's women without their husbands anymore who have died, who are Jews, but they were born Greek. They don't speak Aramaic. They don't speak like the natural language. They speak Greek. And the scriptures that they read have been translated into Greek. So in many ways, you could say, these are some folks that have been marginalized. Not within the culture, but within the family. And some people said, look, in, in our family, what do we do? We share everything. We're family. And nobody goes without in this family. And so if we're going to be Jesus' people and there are folks going without something, we've got to do something about that. And so they bring this to the attention of the apostles, the leadership of the family. So we'll read this together. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers. <laughs> It's always encouraging, like, right? I said it last week. It's so nice to know they're not perfect. Saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. And they said, we need to have a little family talk. We apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. It's a little arrogant. At least it sounds that way at first, doesn't it? And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. 
Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. And everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor or Nicanor, who knows. Timon, Parmenius, Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Wow, isn't that crazy? These seven men get deployed into more responsibility in the family. They attend to a need that's in the family, and the church explodes again, even to the point that Jewish priests look and see how this family's living, and they say, I want to live like that too. I want to live like that too. All right, just a couple things I want to point out from the scripture this morning. The first is, the apostles draw a line when the issue comes to them. They say, we're not to do that. Now, I don't think that they're saying that feeding the widows are not important. I don't think they're saying that well, we don't care about those widows at all. I do think that they know the only way that other people can rise up and grow in their leadership is if they're given more responsibility within the family. In other words, the only way that people can move through a threshold, can move through a glass ceiling in their journey with Jesus, is if they're given the responsibility that helps them to do that. Another way to say it is, is, is the only way that these other followers, these seven can get what the apostles have as if the apostles reproduce their breakthrough into their life. You see, the apostles, they've already had this same situation happen for them. You remember, there's a huge crowd that's followed Jesus. They walk up to him at the end of the evening, and they say, buddy, we've got to let these folks go. They've got to find something to eat. It happened two different times. There was 5,000 and then 4,000. We've got to help them find something to eat. They're saying this, hey, there's a need, Jesus. We've got to figure out how to meet this need, which is exactly what's going on here. And what did Jesus say to them? You feed them. You feed them. They said, well, he said, well what do you have? Well, we got some sardines and some saltine crackers. He said, well, give it to me. And he blessed it. And what happened? They fed everyone. They've already had this moment of breakthrough within their life. And so it doesn't do them any good just to reproduce that same breakthrough. They know the only way that the family will grow in their leadership, that people can grow through a glass ceiling, is if they reproduce the breakthrough. They give what they already have to those who don't. And so they come and say, look, we've got some folks who need to be fed. And he said, well, you feed them. We're not going to feed that. We're not, I've already got that breakthrough. You feed them. And as a result, these seven men probably do a much better job than 12 apostles ever would have done. And the church grows rapidly. Grows rapidly. Church gets together. They begin to discern who should be the ones to lead this out. And there's a man by the name of Stephen that is called to lead it out. Stephen, as the scripture said, is a man of full of faith and the Holy Spirit. In other words, they said Stephen has the character that he's ready for another level of leadership. He's ready to move through the glass ceiling. He's ready to have something reproduced within his life. Now here's what's interesting. Whenever we move through one glass ceiling, whenever Stephen moves through this glass ceiling, it's just in preparation for the next glass ceiling of his life. Because if you're not moving and growing, you're dying. And just two chapters later in this story, we see this man, Stephen, who's on trial for being a follower of Jesus. And he gives, perhaps, the most beloved, sacred testimony that we have in all of this story. If you haven't read it, you just should read it. 
He goes from the very beginning, unpacking who God is and what God has done, and stands up in public in front of everyone, knowing that as soon as the words come out of his mouth, he's going to be the first Christian martyr. He's going to be killed for his faith. And he owns who Jesus is in his life. Well, I think as he breaks through that glass ceiling, I think this glass ceiling, this threshold, was just preparation for that to happen. Because what has he experienced? He's experienced that as a result of the work that God's doing in him, the church grew rapidly in his faithfulness. Would that not encourage him with courage? And then he moves to that next glass ceiling. I think that Stephen's legacy is only possible to us if the apostles were willing to reproduce their breakthrough into Stephen's life. In other words, if they gave Stephen an opportunity to play. They gave him a chance to play on the playground. All right. So what's this mean for us? Well, just again, I think that if something's not on the move and growing, it's dying. The way that you know you're alive is you're moving and growing. I mean, it's obvious. If all of a sudden it's time for church to be over and one of you sitting there and you're not moving and we leave you there like for a few weeks and you haven't moved and, you know, your belly hasn't got any bigger than what it is right now. Or, I mean, it's obvious, like, you're dying or dead. It's one of those two things. But, and nothing could be more truer than when it comes to our discipleship journey. If you're not moving and growing into living the Jesus life in your life, you're dying. If I'm not moving and growing, I'm dying. And so I know that we look at the landscape of our culture and our society and we think, man, look at the way the church is being persecuted against and look at the way the church is in decline and look at all this and this is happening and we want to blame culture on that. Well, as I look at it, I just think we got a lot of dead Christians. Why wouldn't it decline when you got dead Christians? Why wouldn't it retreat when you got dead Christians? When you got people that claim to be one thing, but they're just sitting stagnant, they're not moving or growing, of course it's going to retreat. Of course it's going to decline. The reason why we physically are alive when we're growing and moving is because that points to the deeper truth of spiritually. We don't grow and move physically in terms of that makes us alive because that's the primary foundational way and what it means to be alive, it's just pointing to the deeper truth that you're truly alive spiritually, eternally, when you're moving and growing. And if you're not, you're dying. So the big question, I think, is this morning is how do we reproduce the breakthrough that we've received, and how do we get the next breakthrough? So once I've kind of gone through the journey of waiting and receiving and implementing and sharing, reviewing, how do I reproduce that breakthrough in someone else? And then how do I go about getting the next breakthrough within my life? Well, as I look at this story and look at these early Christians, they were disciplined in how they reproduce leaders. One of the ways that we talk about that here at Crossroads is they had a leadership pipeline. They had a way in which a, a disciplined uh, formula, if you will, framework for how they reproduce leaders. They recruit, they train, they deploy, and they review. And every time that you've been recruited and trained and deployed, now that you're living into that, you then can give the same thing to someone else. All right? Let me just put it up here on the board for those of you all that can see it. That's hel- it's been a helpful lens for us. So you've got recruit, train, deploy. 
and then if necessary, review always, and if you need to, more training. Recruit, train, deploy, and review, all right? In other words, if I've got a certain breakthrough in my life, if I've moved through a glass ceiling, my job is now to reproduce that into someone else. So the first question I want to ask, who am I recruiting? Who am I training to get this breakthrough? Who have I deployed to get that breakthrough? And then I want to ask the question, who's recruiting me? What am I being trained in? Where am I being deployed? How am I moving through these glass ceilings of my life? I think a question I'd be worth asking is who is leading you through their pipeline? In other words, who's shepherding you? As you're moving and growing, who's reproducing some breakthrough they've gotten into your life? And then the second question would be, who are you leading through your own pipeline? In other words, who are your sheep? Who are you reproducing in the breakthroughs that you have received? So let me just paint a couple of pictures of what this looks like within my life right now that may help to bring it from 50,000 feet down to the ground a little bit. So Chris and Lisa Warner spent some time being discipled with Amanda and I. It was a fantastic journey we had with them for a number of months. And one of the things I noticed about Chris is Chris is wired in a way that he loves Scripture. He loves the Bible. He loves to learn. He's just wired that way. And one of the things I know that we have here is a content delivery team where we develop out all the content that we're doing, whether it's the workshop this weekend or the stuff on Sunday morning. So I went to Chris and I said, Chris, I said, man, what if if you spent some time every week that you were able doing some background work on sermon prep, on the message prep? He's like, man, I've never been to seminary. I don't know if I could do it. I said, you don't need all that. That's just a whole bunch of debt. I I wouldn't even go there. Right? You got the Holy Spirit. You love Jesus. That's all you need. You're part of a family. That's all you need. Let me, let me kind of take you through how I go about that. And for the last year, Chris, when he's able to on most weeks, sends me like two pages of all the background work for the message. It's amazing. It's amazing. Everything today that you're hearing came from him and his work this week. I'm just communicating it. It all came from him. Isn't it amazing stuff? It's just fantastic. Now, I came to him a couple of months ago, and I said, man, I think it's probably time for the next step. He's like, well, what do you mean the next step? I'm like, well, if you're not growing or moving, you're dying, buddy, right? Where's the next threshold? I'm like, "I, I think we need to move into what it looks like to develop and craft a message. With the end vision is this, like, if I'm the only one that can speak up here on Sunday morning, then you guys need to go find a new church, because we're not reproducing anything. My buddy, God's got way more for you than that, so we're going to move through that, right? We're going to move through those thresholds. You recognize, who are the people that God's calling me to reproduce myself in? So I recruit him, I train, I deploy, I review with him. Yesterday, Becky Hoy, who's on our Northside New Church plant team, who was on staff here, she's leading out a social space for this workshop. She's never led a social space as part of the the, the, the rhythm of the weekend. She's leading it all out. And she's doing an amazing job. She's got some work to do, but she's doing a great job. Why is that? Recruit, train, deploy, review. Places where I'm shepherding those around me. Now, at the same time, I also need to be a sheep because if I'm not moving and growing, I'm dying. And so one of the things that's happening right now is I'm learning from someone else what does it look like to build out a network of churches, significant leaders in churches in the southeast who are running after discipleship and mission in such a way that we could pull together to reach everyone for Jesus. And I'm learning how to bring those things together and to build that out. A couple of weeks ago, I was in eastern North Carolina leading a workshop, and for the first time, I was leading it on my own with a team that I had recruited. But I was only able to do that because someone recruited and trained and deployed me into that. I'm saying all that to just give you a couple of ideas, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be big things. It could be as simple as, I'm learning how to be a better husband. 
and I'm going to recruit this guy into my life because he's a crummy husband. And I'm going to recruit him in, and I'm going to train him how to love his wife. And then I'm going to deploy him out so that he can do the same thing for someone else. Right? It's those kinds of things. If we're going to live the lives that Jesus died for, right? if you're going to live the life that Jesus died for you to live, you've got to break through the glass ceilings. You've got to move through the thresholds. In other words, you've got to be willing to reproduce the breakthrough that you're receiving that's happened in you. You've got to then reproduce it into other people. So just two questions I'll leave you with this morning. Who's reproducing in you today? When it comes to the next step in your journey of discipleship, who's reproducing in you today? And then who are you reproducing in today? Who are you giving what you've received? And so if, if I was you, I'd, it would be helpful just to simply ask the question of, okay, where am I? My guest, my friend, my family, my son or daughter, my spiritual parent. And that'll tell you where to go next. Now, I enjoy being a kid growing up. Um, and, you know, worship team, if you guys want to come on up, that's fine. I'll close here. As when I was a kid growing up, I, I enjoyed being a kid. But I got to tell you, being a parent, although it's more difficult, man, it's a lot more fun. Holy cow. Like watching your kids get it, man, it's so much fun. And spiritual parenting is the same way. The reality of it is, is those first four stages, that's just training. That's the pregame. The real game that Jesus wants us all to be in is how we're reproducing our spiritual DNA into other people that they can go and do the same thing. And man, when you have grandkids, you guys know what that's like, some of you in here. That's even better. That's even better. All right, I'm going to pause there for this morning. I'd love you just to be thinking about what's the one thing that's grabbing your attention today? The thing that's grabbing your attention this morning, that's probably the place that the Lord is wanting to speak to your heart. That heartburn. And the way in which I'm learning to hear from God is I just ask the question, what would a good and loving and perfect father who doesn't want to me be a dead Christian and be till alive, what would he say to me in that? It may be a word of affirmation today. Like, man, you're doing a great job. Keep doing it. It may be a word of conviction this morning. It's never a word of guilt. That's not from the Lord. It could be a word of conviction, a word of affirmation. And as you hear that, the question will be, now what am I going to do with it? What's God saying to me, what am I going to do with it? Just as we sing together this morning, um, we get to begin taking steps towards that, this last song. Um, one of those places is the Lord's Supper, and this is the meal of grace and mercy and peace. This is the meal of people who are moving and growing. You are welcome to feast at this table. As you come here, you leave the place of death and come to the table of life. They'll tear off a piece of bread. They'll tell you the body of Christ is broken for you. You can dip it into the cup. They'll tell you the blood of Christ that's shed for you. Over here we have some candles. If you'd like, for those of us who are more sensory, if you'd like to come and light a candle as just a way to ask God to bring some light into some darkness within your life or a situation, feel free to do that. Chris and I will be over here. We'd love to leverage faith and pray for you. If there's a place in your life that you would like to be better, we'd love to pray for you. If you'd like to do something different this morning, you have free reign in this place. As we as a family start stepping towards the things that God has spoken to us this morning. So as you're able to, as you're able to, why don't you stand with me today as we sing together?